out in the territories. So she made the three week trip back to Detroit where there were doctors and hospitals at that time. Uh, he, at the age of 14, Joy was moving great with his younger brother, Mark, from Nebraska City to Omaha, some roughly 80, 85 miles. At the age of 21, he moved here into Aurora, Illinois, and was working at that time for what was then the Chicago Burlington Quincy Railroad. Uh, in 1883, he moved downtown, went to work for a company down there, which he eventually bought in 1886 on his 31st birthday. Two years later, founded what we know today as the Morton Salt Company. Have you ever seen the little box with the girl with the umbrella? When it rains, it pours. And that became a symbol for Morton Salt in 1914. Well, here we are. This is the north part of our East Woods now, and you might look at it and think, well, it looks a little different than what we saw before, and it is. 96 to 97 percent of the woods in here are sugar maples. Prior to settlement, this was a mixed woods of red and white oak, hickory, and sugar maple. Well, in the early days of settlement, the state controlled most of the land up here, and they divided it up into five and ten acre woodlots. As a settler, you would have bought five acre woodlot. What you bought were the rights to the wood, not the land. Well, all of those trees, having been removed for structural timbers, for siding, for roofing, for furniture, for heat, it had been denuded. This had been clear cut. And what grew back fastest was the sugar maple. And because they create, as you can see when you look up above, they create a very dense canopy. So because they do that, they excluded all of the other trees. And that's why this is all sugar maple. We don't tap these because it's, the sap runs so irregularly with their size and light and things. And we use three big old sugar maples on the west side that we do tap for demonstration in March. It requires 40 gallons of maple sap to make one gallon of pure maple syrup. So if you ever wondered why maple syrup, good maple syrup is so expensive in the stores, that's why. If you look off to your left now, uh, out away from the tramways, you'll see a whole lot of tree trunks. The canopy is about 55 or 60 feet up in the air. That's our Norway spruce plot. Mr. Morton planted those like a corn crop because he intended to harvest those. A Norway spruce form a very straight, tight grain, very stable structural timber. He started that in 21, 22. Unfortunately for him, Norway spruce don't like our northern Illinois soil, and they do not like our northern Illinois winters. They are not long enough, and they are not cold enough. So because of that, those never grew big enough for Mr. Morton to harvest. However, they're kind of a unique little area for us today. If you walk through the trail that goes through there on a day when it's 100 degrees out here and 100% humidity, and you walk into the plot, you'll notice it's cooler. It can be as much as 20 degrees cooler inside the spruce plot. Now, I stop here at Big Rock just for a second because you can't see the rock. You gotta take that little trail that off, goes off to the left out here. It's about a quarter mile round trip. But take a look at that sign. You see an elephant and a rock and a school bus. Well, the rock is as big as the elephant, but weighs as much as a school bus. Geologically, it is called an erratic because it doesn't belong here. Remember I said our, our bedrock here was sandstone limestone? That is granite. That's why it weighs so much. Uh, geologists have looked at it and said, well, it comes from north of Madison, Wisconsin, possibly as far north as the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, was dragged here during the last glaciation period, and when the, glaci the ice sheets retreated some 14,000 years ago, it was dropped and left here at the Honey Armory and Grounds. That little trail that you see that I pointed out there is a little over a mile long if you walk the whole thing. And it walks through all these woods that are off on our right. And that's a unique woodland because it has never seen human habitation. Now the trees have been removed, but the land itself has never seen habitation. It has never seen a plow. It is as it was left, 
as the glacial sheets retreated some 14,000 years ago. Not many of those places left in this part of the, the world anymore. And if you do take that trail, there are some there are really some nice uh, educational signs that explain what you're looking at, how the glaciers affected this area, and then how the tall grass prairies, what they did to it later on. If you look out to your right now, you'll see one of our wetlands in and of itself, not probably the prettiest thing out there, different from anything else, except 1952, when the Arboretum purchased that property, there were horses and cows grazing out there. 1984, one of our ground crews was out, discovered the water that's in there, realized that the farmer had tiled that area, so we removed the tile, let it go back to its natural condition. There are some pretty interesting plants in there. There are four very, very rare wetland plants that have shown themselves in there, and there are six people here at the Arboretum that know what they are and where they are, and they will not tell anybody. Because as we all know in this day and age, you tell somebody they're going to plain disappear. Well, here we go on the left-hand side is our beech tree collection. And if you look at those two trees just down slope from us there, and that's why I stopped, because why don't you take a look. Look at that bark. It's gray and it's smooth, okay? Now take a look at the base and how the root structure comes into the trunk of the tree. It has led people to say that those look like elephant toes as they join the trunk. And because of the color and smoothness of, smoothness of the bark, they say it looks like elephant skin, and there are a few people who call that the elephant tree. Oh, totally. yeah. And they are native here in northern Illinois. You'll find them more prevalently up uh, in the Lake County area where there's more sand closer to the lake. Uh, the two trees adjacent to us here are European copper beech, and then down below when you peek through there, you'll see a weeping beech that's out there. We do have a Which copper and a weeping yeah, beech up by the ground cover collection of birds here at the Arboretum. Uh, roughly 140 of those visit us either in the spring or the fall or both, depending on their migration uh, habitats. The other 80 we consider permanent record uh, residents. Some of those uh, are here actually 12 months out of the year. Some of them, like our songbirds, will go south in the winter, but come back up here in the very early spring. Five of them, probably the more unique ones, are things like the pileated woodpecker, the downy and ladderback woodpecker, the red-tailed hawk, and Cooper's hawk. Those are all here 12 months out of the year, and of that five, the most unique is the pileated woodpecker. It stands 18 to 20 inches tall. It is the biggest of the woodpeckers. Uh, it has a red knot, not a red head, but a red knot on the top of its head. And if you're ever here and in that area, either by Big Rock or walking in the trail through the Norway Spruce Collection, and you hear what sounds like a big old bass drum being banged on, it's the pileated woodpecker up in the top of those spruce trees looking for lunch. And if you've never heard it, trust me, it does sound like a big bass drum when it's pounding up there. We did have a couple of birds that we hadn't seen in almost 100 years last year, starting about the middle of January until migration season in October. We had a pair of bald eagles visit us. Uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen, and we have had some staff and some of our visitors spot them again this spring of this year, so we know they've come back, which means that maybe one of these fine days, fine years, as their populations continue to grow and they work their way back into their native habitats, and yes, they were native to Illinois. Uh, you may look up someday when you're here driving on a tram or walking and find a bald eagle's nest. We have some 180 other species of wildlife that live here, things like I mentioned, the white-tailed deer and coyote and fox and chipmunks and possums and skunks and all the rest of our fun furry friends, but we have one that most people don't know is native here in northern, to northern Illinois, and that's the mink. That crazy little critter we make mink coats out of is native to north, uh, northern Illinois, and we have a couple of families that live down along the river. As we leave the woods behind, we're going to go back into our regional collections, and the first one up is on our right. That's our plants of Appalachia or Appalachia, and it does depend on where you are in the mountains. 
how that word is pronounced. One of them is that orange berry tree there, that is mountain ash. It's Carolina allspice, bladder nut, spirea, and a few others that grow naturally out in the mountains. And the one really fun character here on our right with these droopy leaves that look like it probably should be down in the tropics somewhere, that's pawpaw. It does bear a fruit. The fruit looks like an obese banana. You, they're there. They're actually growing in there. I stopped and looked at them the other day. Uh, they grow underneath those leaves. You don't know they, where they are. Humans don't get them a lot. They are very, very tasty. Uh, animals get them. Uh, and one particular company in Paw Paw, Michigan gets them. It's a microbrewery that makes now Paw Paw beer. So by God, we'll make beer out of darn near anything these days around around the world. Well, now we're going to leave the North American continent. We're going to go west across the Pacific into the Asian part of the world, the area that Mr. Morton dearly loved to travel throughout his lifetime. About 85% of the plants you see around us are plants that he brought back from his various trips. He'd bring seeds back, plant them in a greenhouse, and while he was alive, he was working with a uh, famous landscape architect, O.C. Simon, and at the proper time, they plant them in the area where you see them. We have one of the largest collection of Asian plants outside of their native habitats. Uh, China is around us here, over this little knoll on my left, the plants of Korea. And then across this little slough that we call the Japanese slough, are the plants of Japan. And that area over the next couple of years is under renovation along with work we're doing on uh, the east branch of the new page. And kind of look while we're going by, because every once in a while, out there in that water, we'll find a great blue heron sitting fishing. Uh, you might not see one, but you might look and see. I stop here because of these two trees that are just on the other side of that path. Uh, those are ginkgos. Those were Mr. Morton's favorite tree. He loved them for a couple of reasons. One, they're the only plant in the species. Unlike the rose, it has thousands. The ginkgo only has one, and they have a male and a female. Second reason he loved them is because they can live to be 2,000 years old. They are one of the oldest plants we have on the planet. The trees, these two, and then there's a little grove up in front of us up here. Uh, they're from the they're remnant populations. Every ginkgo that's alive today is from remnant populations that survived the last great extinction. So. 65 million years ago. As a plant species, they have been fossil dated over 265 million years of age. Uh, they will probably outlive the human species by a lot. Uh, they are the most pollutant tolerant we have. You can plant them next to an operational steel mill in Pittsburgh and they would be happy. And to prove that, there are six ginkgos alive today that were less than one mile from the epicenter of the first atomic bomb in Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. And one of those ginkgos is almost 800 years old. 